Welcome to Newsdesk on SiliconANGLE TV for Thursday, November 1st, 2012. I'm Kristen Folletti. In 2005, Hurricane Wilma blew through the South Florida region, leaving millions of citizens and thousands of startups without electricity for over a month. As the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy is being publicly discussed by the NYC startup community, we turn to SiliconANGLE founding editor Mark Risen Hopkins to discuss his experiences as a startup founder in the aftermath of Wilma. Welcome, Mark. Howdy. Kara Swisher from All Things D sat down with Foursquare founder Dennis Crowley Tuesday night in Manhattan to discuss the effect of the hurricane on the NYC tech and startup scene. As someone who's seen a startup suffer its fate at the hands of a hurricane, what comments and thoughts do you have on what Crowley said? So, uh, you know, Crowley's, Crowley's in the thick of it right now uh, and uh, probably, probably just a little bit shell-shocked, I would say, um, just because of the way that, uh, I mean, that's how a hurricane affects you. Uh, I, I, uh, like you said, went through Hurricane Wilma after uh, uh, you know, just, just uh, you know, just walking out my front door. Um, I I spent probably I don't know, like two or three hours, just kind of day in a days walking around, just like before I kind of snapped to and was like, okay, you know, let's let's get some stuff done. Um, so he's probably experiencing a little bit of that. But uh, the comments that he said were, were or gave uh, were very tactical and almost uh, reporter like. He was talking about a lot of the things that were. You know, they, they were doing in preparation before the hurricane and, and kind of in reaction to the hurricane. I don't think New York in general knew what to expect because <clears throat> Irene, previous hurricane that affected the area in recent years, did almost no damage whatsoever. Um, this damage, uh, this, this hurricane, of course, killed uh, 16 people in the whole region uh, and, you know, billions of property damage. The, uh, the power's out, uh, the... the Trains aren't running, taxis aren't running, taxis are, you know, under three feet of water. So there, there's a, just a lot of logistical issues that he is having to deal with, and that's what he spoke to a lot uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, he spoke to a lot of the collaboration that uh, is going on between a lot of the startups in the community, which I thought was uh, something that uh, was unique uh, to the New York scene. Uh, it might happen in a few regions in America, but... Uh, Maybe Palo Alto, if a hurricane ever could possibly hit Palo Alto or San Francisco, but uh, or some other natural disaster. But uh, in New York, uh, they have a, uh, the benefit of having a, a burgeoning and therefore somewhat close-knit startup scene, and, and he was talking a little bit about that. As of yesterday, 1.6 million were out of power in the areas affected by Hurricane Sandy. How does this compare to your experiences in affected hurricane areas? So uh, I was in... Uh, uh, like I said, I was, I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida uh, in 2005. Uh, Hurricane Wilma came through, and I literally thought there was going to be you know, no problem. We'd, we'd already had like seven other hurricanes that year and no substantial amount of damage. It was also the year of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, had come through just a month earlier. Uh, of course, devastated the New Orleans area, but uh, did very little damage to, to Florida. And I think uh, most of us in the area were feeling pretty cocky about, yeah, we just throw another hurricane. We can take it. Um, and uh, much to my surprise and most of the other people's surprise, it knocked out power for almost the entire region from uh, Boca Raton down to uh, South Beach, uh, even into some of the Keys, uh, it, power gone for three and a half weeks. And you, you learn very quickly um, <laughs> how a barter economy works uh, because you can't access your money, uh, you can't gas up your vehicles, uh, you can't make uh, reliable phone calls, cell networks are down. I mean, just it's it's uh, turning back the clock 100 years um, very quickly. And uh, so uh, I don't think, uh, you know, conversely, Hurricane Sandy, only 1.6 million people being affected out of, you know, tens of millions in the whole region. So uh, not to, to diminish the, the, the pain they're going through because there's very real pain and very real economic damage to the area, but it's not quite to the level of some of the worst disasters America's seen recently. If a startup made effective usage of the cloud and technology-enabled cloud-like tools, how much damage could they save themselves? Would that be a startup saving grace? It, it very well could be. So, uh, of course, uh, AWS, Rackspace Cloud, these public clouds did not exist uh, back when my startup was uh, there. I, I, at the time, uh, this is back when John Furrier, our, other, uh, our founder, was running uh, PodTech. I was running a company called Blip Media. Blip Media had uh, three quarters of the world's uh, podcast creators were using our servers at the time and uh, uh, as their broadcast medium. And we didn't have 
a real cloud solution. We were at the we, we had a, a backup solution at the planet, which saved the data. But the servers that actually ran all the, the scripts that made uh, podcasting through your phone possible or podcasting, just uploading your podcast to a website possible, were run out of servers there in South Florida. And, and as a consequence, we're under about two and a half feet of water. <laughs> and so did not work. Uh, if, if we had uh, had a you know, good uh, strategy, a better backup strategy uh, for not just the storage, but the compute, uh, or if uh, Amazon uh, web server had existed, uh, we would have had a better chance of surviving that, at least coming out with something we could have saved the company on the other side, just other than just the raw data. Um, the other thing that uh, is, is very important to note is that just because your your operation your, your digital operations and your your data is safe um you know code requires constant maintenance and, and that was certainly the case with what we did uh code had to be tweaked on a daily basis and i was the major i was the, the primary contributor to the code base and i had no electricity i had no way to check in on my code and see what scripts were broken and you know very quickly the whole thing stopped and it all ground to a halt uh, because I couldn't bug fix, uh, and I didn't have any other coders in non-affected areas that could do apply bug fixes. So, even if your cloud uh, keeps your your your, uh, your operations safe, um, you have to make sure your your people operations are are fully redundant, uh, geographically redundant. Is there much benefit to having a maturing ecosystem of citizen journalism if there's no electricity around to access all of those resources? Yeah, that's a fair point, because this is the other thing that uh, most of us have noticed, and I think you guys have talked about in the last few days uh, on the program here, is is all the citizen journalism. I think uh, um, was it, uh, Jack, uh, one, of, one of the founders of Twitter, I can't remember which one, uh, tweeted out yesterday to, to a lot of fanfare. I'm so proud of Twitter right now. You know, they're you know, doing that citizen journalism thing. But, you know, uh, in a situation where New York is, there, there's enough people with still, like New York City and, and, and the whole Northeast region, there's enough people with power that it, Citizen journalism is of significant benefit right now. Uh, if you if you turn back the clock to 2005, apply today's technology ecosystem to 2005, and uh, say, okay, Hurricane Wilma, you know, use your, do yourself some citizen journalism. You, you're gonna, you know, who cares? It's not gonna work. I don't have, I don't have a, a thing to anything to charge my phone with, <laughs> so I'm not gonna be logging onto Twitter to to, to check the. Uh, you know, check check the the headlines or anything, or, or see it's it's all word of mouth, and, that, and that's what I experienced is that uh, our best we weren't we weren't even getting regular newspaper deliveries. Like it, we got a newspaper once every you know three weeks because the newspaper wanted to uh, save uh, the gas that it had for important deliveries. So we went through once every three days, twice a week, maybe three times a week. We got a newspaper. Um, uh, so. All our news was citizen journalism. It was me talking to my neighbors saying, hey, you know, did you hear about that thing down the road? In a situation where mid and long term survival is a net question, how can a tech startup come out ahead in the wake of a natural disaster? So personally, this was the biggest lesson of uh, going through a, a situation like this is that you have to think like a hustler and which is very well suited for startup communities. Um, B, if you've got a situation like what New York City is in right now, uh, providing valuable data to people in your community, whether that be people that are geographically situated very close to you um, or uh, socially situated close to you in, in a startup community that could spread over an entire region, but you know, you, you know people from all parts of the Metroplex or something like this. Uh, being uh, a valuable conduit for data or valuable conduit for services or help or assistance or any of these things will in, endear you and endear uh, your organization uh, to others. And you'll come out ahead as an organization or as an individual, as someone that not, I mean, your true colors show through in a, in a disaster uh, situation, uh, just as a general rule about humanity. And if you can position your organization, you know, culturally, to be of value to those around you, um, people remember that. And people will remember your organization and the people in your organization for the good that they do in a natural disaster. In a worst case scenario, like the aftermath of Hurricane Wilma, an entire region of the country can see their power down for the better part of a month. At what point do the stakeholders in a startup stop thinking about the company and start thinking about more pressing matters? 
So uh, I was, I, I've reacted relatively quickly personally. I was, you know, of course, one of the founders of my, of two companies at the time, actually. Uh, and so I had probably about 20, 30 employees to uh, be concerned about, uh, about, about 15 of which were actually within walking, lived within walking distance of, of where I lived. So um, I think whenever you hear the reports and, and uh, that power or, critical services for your region uh, in New York City that would even extend to uh, mass transit uh, are going to be down in excess of four to five days. That's when you need to start thinking about uh, less about uh, company needs and more about individual needs because four or five days is kind of the breaking point for society. You know, uh, you have, there's a saying, you know, we're, we're only about three meals away from total anarchy in any society, in any country. Uh, and that's true. If you don't know where your meal is, next meal is coming from, you know, paying rent on the, on the servers is not going to be a, <laughs> it's not going to be a big concern, right? So uh, my my personal strategy was to, um, to 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 look into ways that I could you know apply help my employees apply for government assistance, FEMA assistance, uh, or. Uh, uh, what, what, what the, the name for it was uh, disaster unemployment relief uh, because I knew our operation being being a technology both the operations being technology based operations we're not going to function not going to be able to provide a paycheck uh, if we couldn't have access to the internet as a company uh, for more than five or six days uh, so I you know immediately snapped into action uh, pulling together what resources I could to uh, help my employees apply for disaster relief because you know when most employees uh, you know can't go you know, mo most employees can't go a couple months without a paycheck you know and disaster or not you know the landlord still wants his rent money so you got to take care you got to take care of your employees you got to take care of your people resources first and uh, I'd say the demarcation point is about four or five days to really to to really uh, double down on those types of efforts. Well, Mark, thank you so much for sharing your personal experience with us today. Sure. And, uh, you know, we send our thoughts and our prayers out to those on the East Coast who are continuing uh, to live this crisis. Absolutely. And remember, you can follow the news of the day and get the latest breaking analysis here at News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV.